welcome everyone. We're glad that uh, we have um, we have several people joining us today for this uh, discussion about the recertification process of Gen Ed courses. Um, the way we're going to structure it today is we're going to start with a, a panel presentation just to give a general overview of the process and the expectations, uh, but we would like to devote a lot of time um, to your questions. So we um, have posted a message in chat. Please feel free to um, type any questions that you have as they come up during the presentation, or we're, we're a small group, so also if you're more comfortable unmuting your microphone and just asking questions, that's fine as well if you would uh, prefer to do that. Um, so we are joined today by Maggie Slattery and Jody Bender, Yvette Richardson, and Linda Spangler. So these four people will be our panel who will be answering your questions and talking through the whole process. Um, I think Maggie's going to start us off with a, a slide presentation that gives a general overview. <coughs> Thank you very much. I apologize for my voice. Um, this is remarkably good for where I was at yesterday. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm using some slides that were provided uh, for the Schreier Conference by Michelle Duffy, um, who's the chair of curricular affairs. And, um, and so um, we'll go through them, many of them rather quickly because I'll provide them to you. You can use them as a, re a resource um, after the fact. Um, I do would love, you know, questions are probably much more useful than any of these slides. So we'll leave a lot of time for that. Um, <clears throat> there is a video of this presentation uh, from the Schreier Conference on the Schreier Institute's website, if you ever feel like burning another hour and um, you have lots of questions, there's lots of good Q&A there. Um, and uh, while I'm not currently a chair of curricular affairs and I'm not a voice of curricular affairs, I had, I previously spent two years serving as chair of curricular affairs. So I have a sense of what typically happens in curricular affairs. Um, it hasn't changed too much since I was chair, but um, you know there is a little bit of nuance depending on who the chair is. So I'm not um, speaking on her behalf today. <clears throat> okay, I can go forward. Um, so we're going to talk about just a little bit of information about what the process is like because many people don't know the process or don't use the process frequently. So um, just a, a refresher there some tips on preparing the proposal and um, preparing responses to the general education prompts. So we're primarily talking about recertifying general education courses. Earlier, um, while we were getting ready for this meeting, I found that there are 64 EMS courses that need, uh, that were on the books prior to the beginning of recertification. So um, that's not an insignificant number. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I, I think that's why we've been asked to have this session today. So you can go ahead a slide. Uh, there are quite a fair number of resources on the Gen Ed website. It would be under faculty and staff. There's a, a job aid, which is a Word doc of all the possible prompts on a curricular proposal. There's a sample integrative studies proposal. There's a sample. Um, syllabus that the that curricular affairs is looking for so, so curricular affairs is not looking for a syllabi that detail every graded assignment and attended point attendance point in a course they're looking for the durable content that makes up a course so um, there's many many sections that you would include on a good regular syllabus you do not need to include on this you don't need the disability statement you don't need all of that so this, there's a sample syllabus template of you know, the key sections that we're looking for, or what they're looking for. So they're really looking for what makes this course distinct from any other Penn State course, um, and what is the content that would be covered in this course to make it this course. So uh, following the idea of the 80-20 rule, which is that a course needs to be 80% similar amongst different offerings. <clears throat> There's another webinar link there, uh, something that we did that was more focused on the integrative studies courses, which is not necessarily recertification, but is all getting lumped into one. And then on the far left are uh, some websites, uh, the Gen Ed website, the Senate website, and then um, 
the sites.psu.edu LA, that's the liberal arts uh, curriculum website, they've put together a whole list of resources that I think other units will see as useful. Um, and it was all put together by Susie Lynn, who's currently one of the vice chairs of curricular affairs. <clears throat> I think she's been able to put more samples, more sample proposals up there. So uh, you can advance it on. Okay. So this is a really busy slide, but uh, it's helpful to look at the overall flow of the curriculum process and just to kind of get a sense of where all the different approvals are. It's kind of unique in that every unit has a different process. So between one and two and three um, can be quite different depending on where you're coming from. <clears throat> but in general, faculty propose a course or a course change. They ask for consultation. It goes to their um, units for approval. So the three signatories that are required on a curriculum proposal are your curricular affairs rep, a department head, um, and the dean's representative for EMS. So for EMS, I think that's that. <clears throat> Once you have all of that, then it goes to curricular affairs. Um, at campuses, that step often includes a stop at their own senate. Um, it can include a departmental, I'm sorry, a college level committee in some colleges. I don't believe that occurs in EMS. Um, perhaps at some point in the future that might happen here. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little bit of flexibility depending on where you're coming from for one, for two, three, and four. And then once it's at curricular affairs, uh, it, if it needs to go to a subcommittee, so the subcommittees are gen ed subcommittee, any of the special designations, there's a USIL subcommittee, writing across the curriculum, First year, no, not first. Anyways, the, so any of the special designations on a course um, have a subcommittee review. So that means that you need a minimum of two weeks prior to any deadline for it to go through a subcommittee there. <clears throat> Again, this is a lot of small print, so you can look at it at your leisure afterwards, but the, the flow is generally there. Uh, at the end, if curricular affairs approves it and, and I've been getting questions about what if things don't get approved, and very rarely do things not get approved. They may have to go through several iterations, and there might be some compromise, and those are typically more in programs than in courses. Um, but usually, eventually, things get approved. Um, there does need to be a provost, and then there used to be a technical BOT approval. Now it's a rubber, it's a very uh, official rubber stamp. <laughs> They don't question anything. All right, you can go forward. Okay. <clears throat> this um, is a, a set of the dates. This was from this academic year. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> and the proposal due date on the far left column is the date that you would want the proposal to be at the, at the Senate office for the meeting in the far right column. But for recertification, it needs to go through at least one subcommittee, so you need it two weeks prior to that deadline. So um, I put notes on the, of that on the Gen Ed website, but it's worthwhile knowing that that's an absolute drop dead, dead date, uh, due date. Um, and really, that is not the day to get into the curriculum system or anything like that. I guess I, here, uh, Susie's actually said three weeks prior. Technically, it's two weeks, but. So if a course does not, if, if I have a gen end course and I don't do any of this, what happens to that course then? Oh, um, in a year and a half, you'll get notice, uh, notice that says, did you really intend to not recertify this course? And if the answer is yes, you just want to drop the gen ed designation, then, um, the curricular affairs is plan is to look at if that impacts any other units. If it's just truly a gen ed course that's not required by any major or anything, that's not a big deal. And it'll just get dropped. The designation will get dropped. If it's um, a designation on a course that uh, a lot of people use as a gen ed, I don't know, like I'll be ridiculous. Uh, they'll take the GN off of Chem 110. I mean, that's okay. absolutely, right. you know, that's unrealistic, but 
um, you know, that would have to go through lots of deliberations because that course is so widely used in so many majors as a gen ed and lots of other things. So. I have a related question. Mm -hmm. If a university park department is no longer actively offering gen ed course, mm -hmm. but another campus may be offering it, mm -hmm. is university park obligated to initiate the certification of that course? No, that campus can do the recertification. So that um, that example has come up, in, especially around the STS courses, um, where for lots of reasons they were largely created and administratively put under uh, UP colleges, but um, are largely offered exclusively at campuses now. So in most cases, they just we said you know if you've been offering it, initiate it. There's another example. Um, in education, there was a course that was developed here and I was used only at Abington or somewhere else. Okay. Are there any um, <coughs> current gen ed courses that for some reason would be exempt from needing to go through this process? No. Okay. So um, the, we have used, and for lots of reasons, we have used uh, expedited processes for many previous recertifications and other things. So I, for a separate project, looked through all of the old proposals that we have on probably two of our most popular courses, Econ 102 and Site 100. There have been many updates in expedited form to that course, but the original proposals are so old and the expedited forms required such little content. We do not have learning objectives for any of those courses. So then, yeah, that leads to a whole series of concerns. Now, I'm sure that individual faculty members may and even disciplinary communities do, but we do not have anything on the books. So if somebody was to argue the 80-20 rule, there's just nothing there. So if we have all that, we're doing changes, do we have to do consultation? All that kind of... If you already have that on the books? Right, we're just doing a recertification. So it's a time to make sure all those fields are sure. complete and yes. And you, so you got to go through recertification. You got to do consultation just as you're so, recertified. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. We have a course. Because it impacts everybody who's teaching that course. The, the recertification. Okay. Well, it wouldn't impact. It would, basically, you're recertifying, so there's no impact, right? Well, but it's the alignment with the new learning objectives. It's the alignment with the revised domain criteria. It's um, so it's all getting lumped under research, okay. but it's cleaning up lots of things. Okay. So we have a course in geoscience, geoscience 20. It's taught as a continuing ed course. We in the department need to recertify that, even though it's not taught by any of the faculty members in our department. Those are coming back to the university. Okay. I mean, I know it's taught at so, some of the so campuses, it's just not taught here. Because <coughs> it's only taught as continuing ed? At UP, it's only taught oh. as continuing ed. But it, it's offered at the campuses as an actual. And there's a so, faculty member that's been teaching the course, but they're not you know, in our department. Yeah. So in the reality of things, it doesn't matter where the recertification comes from. So if there's a campus who really... But it needs to come from an academic unit. It needs to come from an academic unit, and continuing ed is not an academic unit. Okay, you can go ahead. One more. Um, I, I started, um, I mentioned most of this uh, the next couple slides already, but um, <clears throat> recertification um, collaborative amongst the disciplinary communities. So I guess this kind of goes a little bit with David's question. Um, 
especially in courses where we're changing anything. There are whole groups of faculty teaching that course, and they can't be left out of the process of deciding, is it changing? How is it changing? Or even if it's, um, they just also, they just need to even be notified that things are changing. So consultation amongst disciplinary communities. Disciplinary community, um, think of it as people who actively teach in earth or geocide. And if the pers there's no person like that at a campus, then that's fine. But um, if there is, then we should be trying to include that. What if there is not a regular faculty member? It's always adjunct. Either. <clears throat> so if they're adjuncts, there's, you know, that's all, uh, the campuses are, are less hesitant to require, or they're hesitant to require consultation with adjuncts, uh, mostly because contracts are, are temporary and um, that. But if it's a, um, if it's not a tenure track faculty member, but it's a faculty member who's been there teaching for a long time, um, you know, campuses haven't been giving, been given tenure track positions even fill. So to just say because they're not tenure track is not a no, good that strategy. No, that was the question. But the adjuncts. Long -term teachers. <clears throat> yes. Make sense, but even for the short term ones. Yeah. Somebody may just be hired two weeks before the class starts. Right, so that's not possible. And and, um, and actually, the campuses don't want us to involve them because that involve, you know, implies a lot more commitment. But is there somebody else at that campus? And who would that appropriate <clears throat> person be? Would it be the head? Yes. The, yeah, the ADs usually, because they want to know the changes <laughs> so that when they hire somebody on that FT2, they can say, oh, yeah, there's a new proposal on that. You got to appear to appear. Yeah. So the, um, Division has our, a good strategy for the the five campus colleges. Um, for University College, there's the um, disciplinary. They call them dis disciplinary communities. It's a different usage of the term, but because um, they break it out as humanities, uh, they have different groupings. But. And where would we find the list of that? <clears throat> so actually. Um, um, most of those are also on the liberal arts website, and I thought I'll, I'll put I'll put it on the Gen Ed website too. Okay, um, we'll move down to the next slide. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> the job aid on the Gen Ed website and um, the uh, knowledge base document for the curriculum system step you through every possible prompt through the curriculum system, but um, it's all online at curriculum.psu.edu. And then you're prompted different series of questions depending on your answers to which domain, whether or not it's going to be integrative studies or all, all of that. Um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, so this is a kind of a generic what makes a complete course proposal. Um, the uh, evidence of adequate and complete consultation. So on Gen Ed courses, if you only talk to University Park, that's going to be a flag, um, just in general because it's Gen Ed. And um, you can bolster your consultation response. There is a field about consultation. So it helps if you put in there kind of your rationale for how you picked consultants, like, um, the uh, so like one that is um, CAMS like CAMS courses. This was a little interesting. Yeah. CAMS courses generally aren't offered outside of the University Park. So CAMS is you know can say of all of our thirty five Gen Ed courses, how many they have. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a history of a, a couple being taught at this campus. So we consulted with this campus. We also consulted with you know the primary historian at these two campuses. Um, so you could say something like, uh, Earth courses have a history of being taught X, Y, and Z. We consulted with those locations. Um, or if you're doing something like a 400 level course, um, you know, 
This is a unique 400 level general education targeted to a subpopulation of students that is only half the other student work. But it helps if you put your rationale in there. Um, be well been uh, justified. So if you make an academic change, like that's if you change a prerequisite or something, it needs to be justified. Um, something that faculty have commented on when completing proposals is that there seems to be a lot of redundancy in the fields. Yes. How do we best address that? It's going Just to be, it's case. going to, yes. And it's going to be addressed in the new curriculum system. There's a new curriculum system. <laughs> no one wants to feel left out of new systems. <laughs> <laughs> we're delaying, we're delaying. I'm trying to get it delayed as long as possible. <laughs> I know why the university purchased it. Oh, it's off the shelf. Yay. <laughs> is it related to the project? project? It is. So the same were, software? Yeah, like so they it? were so they're so that they work together, we got the curriculum system that is off the top. So will that replace what's in my app? Will that replace what's in my app? What's in my app? The, the formatting for what the catalog. Uh, <clears throat> the bulletin, the bulletin will, the bulletin is going to replace the course catalog. Um, it will not replace the course schedule. Right. Right. And uh, the fields, so this system that we purchased, which is called Coursely, and then this is the Kim. Um, they work with Campus Solutions, so they they know Campus Solutions, and they have they have their own version of Campus Solutions that they test everything on. Um, <clears throat> will it replace my path? Where did, uh, um, that catalog, you answered it. Okay. So that catalog okay, yeah. part that is just a total mess. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that listing when you go to a subject and. Then are 15 versions of the same course and you don't know which yes, one to click on. That yes, that is going to be that's better with the bulletin. Okay. Now what's not yet better is the course entries and descriptions. So when things merged from ISIS to IPAT, several fields just got smooshed. And that's the technical term. Um, so where they're looking at ways of cleaning up that data. But and, and what's actually prompting that is it looks it looks bad now, but it just kind of also is in a really bad format, so you don't know what part is worse. Um, but when you're in a good format, like it's going to look like in the bulletin, the bad content jumps out at you even worse, and, and even more dramatically. So they're looking at ways of cleaning that up. But you can't clean up the bulletin without cleaning up line path because it's a direct feed. <clears throat> So you need to clean up the source data. Okay. Um, so you can skip to the next slide. Oh, skip. So, um, well, so this I mentioned the sample syllabus, some of the of the areas that gen, the curricular affairs is really looking at. There is the sample template on the GenEd website, but then again. Large sections of what you would normally include as a syllabus are not there. That's that's either very instructor specific or it's boilerplate content. <clears throat> um, go to the next slide. This is so. These are some of the main heading areas under the Gen Ed section. Uh, where you need to address places where um, there's been hiccups is um, in in describing how a knowledge domain or a learning objective is being accomplished in the course, rather than just saying, "Duh." We the curriculum first gets a lot of, "Well, this is a history course. Of course, it's a whatever course." and um, there needs to be a, a bit cleaner articulation of how the course is meeting the learning objective or the knowledge domain. <clears throat> um, actually, at the end of this 
PowerPoint, there's a way that I've mapped out. Like if you have well-written course objectives, how you can map your course objectives to the learning objectives and the domain criteria. Um, so that, that presumes well-written written course objectives, but many faculty have those. So um, that <coughs> you probably already have a good sense of, if you can do that mapping, you know, how your course is doing this in a pretty straightforward way, I think. Um, you can skip to the next slide, move to the next slide. <clears throat> So these are some um, help, some points that were put together by Michelle and Susanna. Susanna. Um, <coughs> anytime the proposal asks for an assessment, it, there are examples. But a cleaner layout of, you know, just an explanation of how a specific assessment would be able to measure a learning factor. I have found this is much more straightforward for um, online courses because they've been developed in a more um, structured way rather than <coughs> right. uh, the next slide is the gen ed domain criteria. So this is how a course is either arts, humanities, social science, things like that. Um, but it's, it's basically, you just need to do the same thing. So consultation. This is some of the uh, standard recommendations for consultation. There's actually a, a Senate report that David wrote on consultation. And that's, that's my fault. It's a committee. <laughs> it was a committee. And, uh, but it, it's, it's the standard by which uh, you know, the consultation recommendations are made. Um, you know, some places have, it, what it really gets down to is content. So finding, or, and discipline. So finding um, persons with the right area of background. Um, and that no college owns a course, uh, you know, it's a university course, no college owns a domain. That's been attempted recently, and <laughs> um, and so that uh, it's just really looking out for this is ways of helping to improve problems with uh, curricular um, redundancy and just in general making sure people are informed. Although it's not an information system. It's not like a spam everybody with curricular consultation because it's a gen ed and they need to know that it's gonna be existing. That's not a strategy either. It's really about getting informed input from somebody who could possibly be teaching the course or has um, something constructive about it. <clears throat> so really looking at where courses have been taught in the last several years and the curriculum system provides you with that. Um, anywhere that's offering programs with similar content, um, especially if there's a major at other campuses. If you're changing a prereq, the, pro, the units that offer that prereq, so if you're going to remove a math prereq or add a math prereq on your math department <clears throat> and math community. And then there's these other ideas that um, kind of bridge large portions of the university. Um, entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, sustainability, like nobody owns those words. You know, people try to. Yeah. And um, don't forget librarians, they're a really uh, helpful resource. I think. I was just going to say, too, and this is just something I've learned over the years, is that if you're going to ask somebody for consultation, I always send them an email outside and just say, hey, I'm going to be sending a course your way. Are you the right person to talk to? And and our response, right. our response rate for consultation is almost 100% because we do that. 
Sometimes they say, yep, send it my way. Sometimes they say a better person is this person. <laughs> Sometimes they say I'm on sabbatical. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing any of that. And so, you know, just kind of letting, letting everybody know kind of outside the system that, I mean, they get emails, the system sends them emails, but, but that way you, you get to the right person and they know it's coming and they know you're watching, right? So you don't get these default acceptance things. So it's a great idea. All right. We can, um, so who is doing what? Um, earlier this academic year in, I don't know if it was August or September, all of the uh, AQ deans got the list of genetic courses. Uh, by we consulted earlier, that list. Yeah, that was the one I referenced earlier, yeah. Um, and Michelle Duffy's been putting, she'll probably, if she hasn't, did she send you a new one for that? I think it's French. Yeah. And no, I haven't updated it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Michelle Duffy ha is, has intended to, um, share an updated list every month or so, but I don't know if that's happening. Okay. Um, so big disciplinary communities that are difficult to coordinate. So the Office for General Education and the Learning Outcomes Assessment Office are doing work to try and encourage them to coordinate. So we did some things with the psych community um, as a, as a model, we're trying some other things with uh, sociology. So if you have a big community that you want to try and get together, we can talk to you about that. Um, and then when you're asked to consult, please consult. Um, but be collegial about it. There's been some, you know, not so collegial feedback from people. Especially when it's, I saw some feedback from a campus. I was like, oh. And his office is at two doors down from hers. That's not so nice. <laughs> um, yeah. It's okay to differ, and it's even okay to say, no, I disagree because of X, Y, and Z, but we all know how, um, how difficult that is. Um, you know, one of the things I think hinders consultation is people are fearful of this negative feedback, and not because they're not willing to take um, constructive input. It's just... It, if it's not being done in a collegial way, then people will kind of defer to avoiding it. Okay, so the last three slides are all on inter, um, integrative studies courses. Uh, that's not really recertification. Could be if you're taking an existing course and making it this, but I don't know. You have questions or? And you mentioned earlier that there's now an NHZH possibility for honors courses. Yes. Uh, my understanding from the Senate office is they have decided to uh, double up on two suffixes. They will have N's for interdomain, C's for length. If you want to add an H to those, you can. What if it's a writing course? They're hoping that there's not many examples of that. <laughs> okay. If it's um, either of those, then they could use the T and M. Well, I think our time is just about up and unless there's yes. any other questions in the room. I don't see any questions online. Mm -hmm. now, we will post the recording on the on our Dutton Food for Thought um, series. Um, yes. And we'll put that as well at that spot as well. But we very much appreciate you coming and oh, spending your time. Yeah,